You're listening to the Hour of History podcast with your hosts, Stephen Bauman and Matthias Fueling, and producer, James Abel. The Hour of History podcast aims to understand how we know what we know and why the past matters. Without further delay, your Hour of History begins right now. Hello, and welcome to Hour of History. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and I'm with Matthias Fueling. I've been incognito for the last few weeks. It's been a very busy semester and but, it's but a, we're back it's a crazy <laughs> semester uh for the world too a crazy <laughs> couple weeks yeah, for the world too i feel like three years ten years worth of events have been packed into what a okay. month a um, week a month at least who who was it was it marx or was it lenin that said like you know there's some like decades where nothing happens and then there's like days where decades happen i think that might like be that. We <laughs> yeah, might, i feel like we're living in, in the latter period might have had a couple of weeks and that really creates a sense among people that you have to constantly be checking and so people seem more tired and people seem more busy because you're always refreshing your twitter feed and i know this week I, i've been checking I, out I, yeah yeah russia oh. what's happening in russia Matthias? um well lots of things putin's it's the election period so uh super competitive right no one knows who's gonna win who's, who's gonna it's be? a nail <laughs> um no putin is gonna be elected um imminently for another period of president i think we should just assume he's gonna be leading russia until he dies or he's killed yeah <laughs> right that's the situation right now but more intensely right um there's a bit of a tiff going on across the the channel uh, across the you know the North Sea between uh, Russia and Britain. Yeah, and so um, anytime something goes bad in Britain, that's of special concern to the United States as well. And we're going to bring that usually in it is to the, <laughs> a later conversation. But this also, anytime you have uh, something happening across international boundaries, the world pays attention. Uh, well, you hope the world pays attention, <laughs> given given sort of the madness that is Washington, where right we don't even know if like anyone's going to be left as part of his cabinet, uh, as part of Trump's cabinet, uh, even by the end of the day. So there's still some uh, worries that that uh, whatever happens in Britain or Russia is just not going to compute. But it should compute because it's really important. So um, what was it? Two, three weeks ago. Um, there March was 4th. March yeah. 4th. Okay, there, so just exactly almost two weeks ago, um, there was... The details are still murky, right? still coming out, but from everything we can tell, there was uh, an ex-Russian spy, ex-Soviet agent, probably worked for the KGB and then its successor agency, the FSB, who had defected, essentially, or went into exile in Britain, who, by all accounts, was also doing work for MI6, so... As these things go, it's still uncertain if exactly if he was a double agent, what exactly was he doing for MI6, but we know that he was poisoned with this incredibly rare, incredibly powerful nerve agent. I think he and his son? His, his daughter. And his daughter and then his son had died earlier, and so they're also worried that had his son been, ki been killed through this agent. And this all sounds sort of like, okay, whatever, but the problem is it fits a very um, ominous pattern to many sort of uh, Russians who have moved to Britain or have fled to Britain who had ties with the Russian government or with the Russian um, sort of secret services. Most famously, about 12 years ago, um, there was a former FSB agent, sort of the Russian kind of FBI, essentially. Um, he, Alexander Litvinenko, who was killed with uh, polonium, um, and then you have various other people who died in mysterious and weird circumstances. Do not in Russia share itself. tea uh, with Vladimir Putin. Yeah, don't don't drink the tea. Um, but also, it's it's terrifying because you know it's like who would kill this Russian agent in Britain? That's like pretty. That's pretty ballsy, right? That's pretty gutsy to uh, just kill somebody who's working for MI6 but in I think Britain. This is also an important point that is a little different from Litvinenko is. Uh, is the current one Sergei Skripal? Skripal. Skripal is uh, he? The British have said that he is a British citizen, so yeah. that makes it. In yeah, so it's so it's war. so it's well, it's, it's assuming or, that well, right? So I guess we'll, I will play sort of devil's advocate, even though I'm, we all know Russian. Well, no, Russia killed this yeah. guy. But like, so the idea is, it's like, say Russia, say this wasn't a hit ordered by Putin. I think that's like what this all comes down to. Was it like a thing where Putin was like, yeah, kill this guy? If it isn't, if right, if the Russian government didn't order it, 
it's still terrifying because that means that some rogue person has access to this incredibly powerful toxin. And I forget the name of it. It starts with an N. It's like worse than sarin. It's worse than any other nerve agent. Novichuk. Novichuk, which is apparently like apocalyptically bad, incredibly dangerous. Which is and at, this, and, yeah. and at the end of the Cold War, I believe Russia was supposed to have destroyed its its stockpiles. So it's also a question of like, well, where did this agent come from? So if the so it's terrifying if the Russian government, aka Putin, ordered it because it means that they're so crazy enough they're so willing like yeah we will go execute you know citizens of a foreign country if they do things that cross us right with sort of this like sort of mafia code of omerta but then also it's terrifying if it's some rogue element it's also terrifying that they can just get away with that or do that because how do they get access to these incredibly dangerous toxins not to mention yeah the relationships that russia has and a similar nerve agent was used to kill kim jong-un's brother in Ooh. malaysia just earlier yeah, so yeah yeah uh, so if people like north korea are also getting hold of this so, nerve so agent, is russia supplying them with yeah. it it's really scary um but the thing is it's also more terrifying because this fits a broader pattern of assassinations or mysterious deaths or suspicious deaths on the part of people who've been critical of the current regime in Russia, people who've been critical of Putin, um, people that have been exposing corruption, and also um, people that have gone into exile in Britain. Um, at Litvinenko, Boris Berezovsky, um, another friend of Berezovsky who was a Berezovsky was a big sort of um, Russian oligarch who sort of came to um, a con into a conflict with Putin and he left Russia. I think it's Nikolai Glushkov, who at one point was running Aeroflot, which is like the Russian national airline. Glushkov just died a couple weeks ago and also mysterious circumstances. Um, and so it, in, <laughs> it in, looks bad. <laughs> in response, the UK came right out and put its foot down. And Theresa May came to the nation and she said, we're going to figure out who it is. And, well, we've, we think it's Russia. And they have 24 hours to respond to us and to admit that it was them. Because they've killed a British person and endangered some British territory. But the thing is, they did, that, they did that with Litvinenko 12 years ago. And exactly jack squat exactly in response like it was like a slight slap on the wrist tony blair was like we can't we can't do anything about russia and so putin of course is going to think and the russians are going to think like who cares like so so what Theresa may gets up there and like you know her bark is bigger than her bite well well so let's, let's say what happened so first. so she'll so okay so she gave her speech you know yeah. the british establishment no matter what, is sort of like, yeah, it has to be Russia that did this. There's really no other people that could have pulled off this operation. This guy is not just a nobody. He's like an ex-Russian Secret Service agent working yeah. for us. You know, anytime a Secret Service agent gets killed, it's always for a reason. Right. Um, but then I think they expelled some Russian diplomats. 23. 23, but like, that's it, nothing. For Litvinenko, it was only six. I know, but like, who cares? Like, like if you're... like. Yeah. It, it depends on how hawkish you are. Like, if you really are these people who say that Russia essentially considers itself to be at war with the West, you know, kicking out diplomats is nothing. Because it's not any real ramification. It's not going to be any real backlash or real response. Because Putin can just say, well, so what? Exactly. Um, I mean, unless you go after, like, for instance, money... Because there's a lot and lot a lot of Russian dirty money flowing through London financial centers... Um, right, like Britain is in London has been sometimes called like London Grad because mm -hmm. it's become known as like the hub of like sort of like the summer home of Russians or the winter home of some Russians or like it's where the wealthy Russians like to go and hang out. Mm -hmm. It's where the Russian elite likes to invest a lot of their money. So unless you do something about that or unless you actually do some sort of active measure, aka maybe you go attack some, some Russian forces, it's really not going to register, I think, as a response, but that's terrifying because if you ramp it up, are you ramping up World War Three? Well, well, so <laughs> yeah, know? so so the Latin, yes. <laughs> so it's you, like, you, is it like, and this is why some people on the left, right, people like Corbyn and these people are like, you know, like, okay, sure, maybe it was Russia, but who cares? It's an in-house dispute. It's this Russian agent killed by Russians. It's not our problem. We don't want to start World War Three. Um, but and so last yesterday, the United Nations Security Council met. They meet in New York City just. To, to get to the United Nations Security Council, they have to walk by Guernica, the famous mm -hmm, Picasso mm -hmm. painting that shows the destruction of war. And in their meeting, uh, the U.S. representative, Nikki Haley, 
um, from South Carolina, she explained that the U.S., and she used very forceful language, very interesting. She said, the U.S. always stands with the United Kingdom. And then she continued on to say, if we don't do anything or if we just slap them on the wrist, the credibility of this organization and of this council will seriously be called into question. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, that sounds nice, but like in recent history, right, the U.S.'s credibility is all has been shattered for a long time. As has the United Nations. As the United Nations has been shattered. But particularly, right, like, so like the big rhetoric in Russia these days and the big fear they're always talking about is color revolutions and regime change and like Western imperialism Right, because we think, what was it, like the Rose Revolution in Georgia in like mm-hmm. 2004, mm-hmm. there was the Orange Revolution, there was like, you know, and then of course we talk about the Velvet Revolution, and so, I don't agree with this, but I, I'm playing devil's advocate right. for sort of the Russian sort of perspective on this, is that we have, a, we Russians have a right to national interest and sovereignty, we have these countries that are right next door to us, that events in those countries directly affect our national security, we have a right to sort of intervene in our areas it's sort of like the monroe doctrine but for like russian neighborhoods or like you know for the like eurasia basically and so they say like you know it's these it's these stupid you know westerners who think that they can like export democracy Mm -hmm. with these color revolutions and they always use the iraq war and afghanistan as like look how well that worked out for you guys and then of course we so we lost credibility with those invasions because we went under their what under like the like the idea like we're gonna get rid of a dictator and spread democracy and then it just just turned into just like horror and then also the red line in Syria under Obama made us look like fools to the international community because it makes us look like we're all talk. Right. And also with Ukraine, like Russia basically put in troops into 2014, Ukraine yeah. and also annexed Crimea and then also basically declared and backed like two separate, like the creation of two separate states allied with Russia. And we've done nothing. Like, you know, and people freak out. It's like, oh, you know, the U.S. is now supplying arms and to, to Ukraine. But, like, really, we've done nothing. And, 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 <laughs> right? when, and when you say we, it's not just the U.S., but the U.K., yeah, 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 NATO, yeah, yeah, yeah. Western and no, Europe. And no, and no European country wants to do anything. Particularly, it's crazy. Like, no European country wants to get involved in Syria. No European country wants to get involved in Ukraine. Not just because it's messy, because everyone's terrified of angering Russia. And that just, I think, further emboldens Putin and, and the Russian leadership because they're like, well, if they didn't do anything about Syria, they didn't do anything about Ukraine, we got away with Litvinenko. I mean, so these sort of arguments, right, that like we shouldn't intervene because it's in like it's just a Russian in-house game sounds good, right? I mean, there are direct interests with what happens in Ukraine and Russia and blah, 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 blah. And it is just like this Russian secret service agent who's killed by Russians. So why should we care? But it's also kind of a slippery slope to, you know, how far do we think that Russian national interest should be allowed to go. But it also means that I think Americans need to quit being hypocrites. <laughs> but I also want to push back a little. The difference now and a difference in the world situation now is that other nations are acting in a more similar nationalistic yeah. way to yeah, Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the United Kingdom, in the United States, other nations are sort of saying, you know, we've been pushovers for this long time. And we're not going to. In fact, the movie Darkest Hour just came out oh, yeah. where it shows Churchill was the only one who was willing yeah, which, to fight. Which is, which is, I mean, that movie was fun, but it's also like total like myth- mythology. Oh, of, of course. Know. But that kind of building up a man like yeah. Churchill, what would Churchill's response be to a, to an event like this? He would say they're attacking the United Kingdom. Yeah, we have to yeah, fight yeah, back. yeah. But then also, I mean, you know, Churchill like is responsible for like the Burmese famine. Well, <laughs> well just all kinds that, of horrible and, stuff. Uh, uh, interesting. <laughs> Interestingly, that did not feature in Darkest Hour. No, well, well, it's also something that no one talks about with Churchill, right? Is is well, I think it's also a weird moment too with like left wing politics, where it's like, right, obviously leftists are like against fascists and Nazis, and in World War II, one of the biggest enemies of fascism and Nazism was like Winston Churchill. But then at the same time, if you actually examine Churchill's policies, super racist, totally for British colonialism and imperialism totally didn't care about this famine that was occurring because they were like taking all of the grain from India to supply you know British troops and so a lot of like leftists are sort of like um, there's no difference between like someone like Churchill and Hitler which then sort of all muddies the moral waters because then you have a hard time defining who your real enemy is yeah but I feel like this is something like I don't know if you saw this so um, this is something I think is really t- like applicable to this situation is like how do people 
in Europe and the United States grapple with its relationship to Russia and what Russia's doing, right, is that the Southern Poverty Law Center, like a few days ago, posted this article by this guy, Alexander Reed Ross, who's a, he's like a historian, I think geographer. He wrote this book, Against the Fascist Creep. Um, he's sort of like known in kind of left-wing circles, but he wrote this article arguing that a lot of these sort of like hardcore left-wing journalists actually end up parroting the same pro-Russian line as like hardcore right-wingers and fascists because they're both united in their like anti-liberalism, anti-imperialism, and that the Kremlin, right, the Russian government uses these kinds of like left-wing journalists as sort of a, as a way of like making themselves look respectable while also making you know Europe and the United States look terrible right sort of muddying the moral waters and it got a lot of pushback and I think the SPLC center got like threatened to be sued by a lot of these journalists and so the so the article was retracted and so it's like this big sort of tiff right is you know how who is the right this is where people will say like russia is bad but it's nothing compared to what you know the united states has done in iraq for example which is which is sort of the putin yeah. response which is the putin response to all of this he's just like yeah well you think i'm bad well look at yourself you know he's like like you have no right to tell me what to do i'm asserting my national sovereignty in my own damn backyard you invaded a country all the way across the world and look how it turned out for you yeah and this is exactly the problem and it's also a problem because of the growth of these um states that are ruled by people who are not leaving anytime soon yeah. if you were born in if you're 18 years old right now yeah. so we're talking about college age students um you live there's, not, yeah. uh, under putin your whole life yeah, and he's putin going is, yeah. to win and be another six years he's going to be there until he dies so we're yeah. talking about an entire generation that's grown up under putin and this is not only in russia this is going to be in china yeah, yeah xi jinping in, well it's in, like in turkey yeah and i think a lot of people are talking about like you know the rise of like the new authoritarianism where I, I don't where I don't know where like, people I guess perceive that what like globalization and liberal democracy took a wrong turn somewhere and in response the only way is to sort of double down create a centralized leadership look out for your national interests and work against this kind of idea that we're just going to knit the world together and through global trade and it's all going to be hunky dory because a lot of this rhetoric is saying that that's just a smokescreen for like American imperialism Right. right, but this is also so okay. So like the idea of you know nationalism. I don't agree with them. No, no, but, no. Right, right. And but that's what they say. And I mean, I think they have in some ways. They have a point that Americans don't like to confront, which is like, well, we did kind of screw things up. Yeah. We, we we did sort of blow up the Middle East. But at the same time, <laughs> like so, Russia is following this sort of nationalistic platform. But their economy is absolutely oh, it's failing. It's they're horrible. they're less than one percent growth. They're um, yeah. they like so Putin's speech. Everyone talked about the nuclear p the part about the new uh, military capabilities, but part of his speech also was talking about improving Russian schools and things like that. And they but can't. You can't do that without money. But that well, the thing is, I think also what's funny about this like new wave of authoritarianism and kind of new nationalism is it's like claiming that we have to do this to improve our country. But really, if you look at it, this sort of new authoritarianism, new nationalism is just a further version of like corrupt oligarchy, which in a way is almost its own form of hyper like globalism, because all of these people have their money stashed in the same spots. Yes. Right. This is what the Panama Papers showed. And, it's mm. not, and like, I think we all knew it, but it, now we have like definitive proof is like all these people are playing the same. Give game. us some yeah. names. They're like, like, like Xi Jinping. Like all of the U.S. elite, Justin all, Trudeau, Justin, all of the like, basically all of the European elites, even like they they all have their money in these dirty pockets of tax havens. You know, they all like talk shit on each other behind each other's backs. But at the end of the day, they all go to the same events. They all like invest in the same things. You know, and so this new in the way, right? So this is why, like, you know, Putin can claim I'm a Russian nationalist. But really, his policies are resulting in the crumbling of Russia because he maintains himself in power through systematizing massive corruption. And he and his cronies just skim billions of dollars every year off the Russian economy. And then they also invest it in like like dark bank accounts all over the world and in like Switzerland. And, and, the, you know, and, the, so, the same and it's like Trump, too. Like Trump claims, I'm a man of the people. You know, I'm a nationalist. But if you look at his policies, 
It's all about corruption. It's all about the money. And and the thing is, so a lot of ways of counteracting this without doing war is sanctions. But those sanctions don't end up hurting the ones at the top. They end up hurting the regular yeah. people, and the ones at the top find yeah. new ways. Well, to we, get yeah, money. we talk about that. I think with Iran, right? Is like yeah. how. Well, I think what's interesting is like the new type of sanctions they've done, like under the Magnitsky Act, which was like pushed by Bill Browder, which is its whole other can of worms. But um, right, the Magnitsky Act says we're not going to sanction whole economies. We're going to sanction individuals, which I think is actually a much better system, right? Because if the idea is that these countries are corrupt because they're being controlled by these like these people, then you go after those individuals. You don't go after the economy because it's not the fault of like some Russian like bus driver, uh-huh. what Russia's doing right. in Syria, right? Exactly. It's not like, like they have no stake in that. You know, and so you need to go after that's the thing, it's like you need to go after like the oligarchs. You need to go after these people who have billions of dollars of dirty money and you have to freeze their accounts because they're the people who are causing the real damage. And the fans of British soccer say do that, but only do it after the Premier League season ends. But that's also kind of, I think like an acknowledgement that we all know that all of these people at the end of the day are like more similar than they are different different right yeah. like Putin, like i really feel like people like this is why like you look at someone like paul manafort right i don't think it's a surprise that he's like in ukraine and all and like all through the 80s right who's he advising who's he campaigning for corrupt dictatorial oligarch figures right and then he just comes to the u.s and does the same thing with trump right i mean it's almost like the globalization of this like similar system of corruption that masks itself Right, it sort of puts up the smoke screen of saying, "Oh, but we're actually nationalists and we're fighting for like our individual countries." When really the elites of all of these countries are like banding together ever more intensely to like group their money together. And what's interesting is the <laughs> elites have ways of bringing this nationalism into make the people actually proud. For example, Russia through its c- corruption networks was able to secure the World Cup for this summer. It's going to be in Russia. It's going to be a huge parade. They yeah. had the Olympics in Sochi. And so yeah. Putin is bringing these sort of like glo- if you're a Russian, that's cool. I would love to have the World Cup yeah. in the United yeah, States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so and I think it's like the weird thing like, I feel like a lot of the stuff that Trump does really makes sense. And if you just look at, like, what happened in Russia under Yeltsin or under Putin, I mean, it's really quite similar. You know, it's like the similar sort of style of governance where you claim you're making your country awesome, but you're hollowing out institutions. You're basically sort of creating institutionalized corruption and you're putting all your cronies at the top. But it's like, how do you fight that? You know, like, how do you work against that? Because you have to at some point say there are like real like political values that are like good right you know like so you're yeah, right yeah they're transcendent you have to like sort of say like yes democracy yes this yes that and but it's hard because there's not many heroes that go back to like churchill we can claim like oh yeah churchill darkest hour great man but then you look at his policies and you're like oh my god <laughs> right as, as, the, as the darkest hour yeah. is happening you know he's yeah. trying to get the indians to join the british effort yeah as they're you know, starving and yeah yeah home. yeah yeah and he's like confiscating all of their grain yeah. and kicking off a famine and you know like calling gandhi like a naked little kafir you know and, and this is and this is what other the argument has been from the other side has and you know had the united kingdom lost world war ii we would be talking about churchill in very yeah. different ways yeah that's the idea is that is that we only like churchill because he won right because you know history is written by the victors and that's yeah i mean but that's this funny thing too because in a way right the way we like always are like people now will kind of like say look how terrible churchill was many russians perceive that to be like we were the ones who lost and our great men are the ones who are like you know always being like crapped on by the west and that's unfair like so that's why like you know russians have consistently in the last few years always ranked stalin as like one of the greatest russians ever even though like in, to, even though to our eyes we're like oh my god but like to them they're like hey stalin you know, made the Soviet Union a superpower, right? right? He took the Soviet Union from this like feudal economy to to like a space to to and like one World War II, yeah, and one World War Two in like a generation. And they'll say, okay, sure, lots of people died, but we won. And I feel like that's almost the attitude that 
people have towards Churchill, right? We just sort of easily just like, well, who cares? He won, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and this is, I, I, it might continue. <laughs> and, mm. and it seems to be going that way. The, um, de- the, the movie that just came out in 2017, The Death of Stalin. Oh, it, it's, uh, it's coming to the Philly United, next week. It's a fantastic yeah. movie Have if you, you haven't it? seen it. Yes. I oh, saw how did you see it? Uh, British Airways. What? Because it's out in... Oh, uh, okay, no spoilers, no spoilers. No spoilers. But it is, I urge everyone, if you get a chance, go see The Death of Stalin. Stalin. It was uh, banned from Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of the same mm-hmm. thing. The West just showing how ridiculous the leadership of, of the communist regime yeah, was. Uh, and, and it's just creating more tensions. Can you imagine if Russia... Well, of course Russia doesn't have the sort of uh, span that British television and British media does. But if Russia put out a movie that just criticized sort of like... Like FDR. Made a mockery of FDR. How would it be received? Or like Lincoln or something like Lincoln. Lincoln, You know, it's like... Yeah, it would not be perceived well. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's a problem is you see this sort of situation where... But then again, that's playing into that nationalist smokescreen of like, how dare they insult us Russians with this like propaganda. But at the same time, it's like the people harming Russians the most are their own leadership. You know, but it could, that could be said about almost any, <laughs> any nation. But I feel like, but I feel like that's sort of the weird political moment we live we're living in, where lots of people are starting to say like, are at least trying to formulate some sort of consensus that we have to push back against this sort of institutionalized corruption that exists at a global level that is that is sort of just running like veins through all of our policies, right? Like all these big companies invest and lobby every major country you know dirty money they all pool their money in the same places they all have their money in tax havens i'm sure like monseco fesco or or that was called right in panama i'm sure that's like the tip of the iceberg oh yeah you know i mean so it's a question i think a lot of people in different countries are going to have to realize like i'm getting on my soapbox but it's like where is a kind of international solidarity going to come from where we can recognize that sure we have national interests but at the end of the day the real quote-unquote globalists are not the liberals they're these like quasi oligarchical right. neo-fascist types we seem so <laughs> del- we seem so del- de- uh, so attracted to these identity things regardless of what's behind it like for one example St. Patrick's Day coming up you have oh, yeah, Bush yeah, Mills yeah, yeah. and you have Jameson there was a time in Ireland where if you drank Bush Mills in the you wouldn't drink Bush Mills in the Republic it's from Northern Ireland Northern Ireland yeah. Jameson was the Republic of Ireland was now they're both owned by multinational conglomerates yeah. but it's still and, and rather because the North Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, things not as hot. The troubles, mm-hmm. you know, there's been. A, it, but we'll see how that plays out with Brexit. Well, you know? yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but um, but now they're both claiming, and especially to American audiences, well, it's St. Patrick's yeah, Day, you've got to drink yeah, Bush yeah, Mills yeah, or, yeah, or Guinness or any of this stuff. And all these are owned by multinational. Yeah. But people don't really. They don't like we 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 so just want to be happy and have our Irish whiskey that we're willing to forget that we're putting a lot of money into the pockets of people yeah. who really well, don't care. And what's terrifying, yeah, well, what's terrifying to me, I think, is this is like my own take. I think a lot of these people, like these corrupt leaders who like use nationalism, um, like they're cynical, right? They don't really necessarily believe in that. I think, for instance, like the Russian leadership doesn't really believe it. Maybe they do in some degree. Like Trump, I don't really think Trump at the end of the day really gives a damn about like American people or American history or, or the American nation, except in like some weird, stupid, schmaltzy way. But they use this hyper nationalism to like boost their credibility. But I'm really terrified, right? Is like once you kind of like let a tiger out of its cage, you don't control it anymore. Yeah. And I feel as if a lot of these people are sort of riding, trying to ride this tiger, thinking that. Particularly, I think in Russia, with like the ramping up of nationalism since R- Putin got elected again in 2012, and in, in America under Trump, is that these people are using like the Republican Party. It's using this hyper nationalism to base its support, but that leads really quickly to fascism, right? Or like yeah. to some sort of na- like incredible evil, right? To exclusionary, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's so so so, in which they don't want to recognize because I think they also maybe in their lizard brain know <laughs> that if you get like a fascist movement it's going to kill them too. Yeah. But they don't want to stop what they're doing That and what they're doing is continuing to build towards that kind of birth of that kind of movement because then they'll lose their power. And so it's like a situation where I've almost said that like Putin almost always like trapped yeah. by his own power at this point or Trump, right? Like they can't leave now because if they do, they'll get killed 
Putin would, I or think. Or go to jail. Or they'll go to jail because they'll be prosecuted. So, but at the same time, so they have no choice but to like boost these hyper nationalist policies. But the more they do it, the more they build this fire that is probably going to burn them in the end. I also think it's no coincidence that the people who are doing these sort of things and, and the people who are more courageous, it seems, are the ones who are closer to death. So Putin's getting to an age like the Russian male does not yeah, live as long yeah. as the Western. Well, plus, too, I mean, the economy is so bad. Yeah. That you think he has to do these things. Because what else can you do to tell. Russians that I mean they know great. that the schools suck. They <laughs> yeah, know yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you do? It's like, well, you you annex Crimea and claim that we're reclaiming our ancient ancestral land, you know? Yeah. Or you get involved in Syria and you claim like, look at us, we're sticking it to like Western imperialists and supporting this like brave, you know, leader in the Middle East against ISIS, right? Yeah. It's all bullshit, but right. but it but it, it helps boost their credibility <laughs> until you see what like the rise of like a Russian fascist movement. Well, so so then so then what can the international response be? We have these organizations, corrupt as they may be and unfair as they may be from their World War II foundations like the United Nations who are they exist to solve problems and they're not solving problems. So how can the world in the international community solve problems? Even NATO, NATO has uh, you know, Article 5 says if one member nation is attacked then you have to respond. Well, Britain's a me member nation and so what is NATO doing? Well, I feel like and this is why I think people are being so like milk toasty and like slimy about it. like it wasn't really an attack because they all know the consequences if they actually say that it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what you're going to see is just a further hollowing out of these institutions because everyone realizes that the consequences of holding to their standards means they have to actually do something, Yeah, <laughs> which none of them want to do. I don't know. I mean, I'm really sort of terrified. Yeah, we've um, also lost, right? speaking of time, I'm terrified. we've lost the generation that fought World War II. They're mm -hmm. dying off. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a generation that fought, uh, and, you know, we have... Or that, like, remembers the similar kind of situations that we're in now. Exactly. I'm, I mean, I'm really scared. I mean, I don't know if there's a good answer other than sort of, like, that schmaltzy, milk toast answer of, like, believe in democracy, believe in liberty fight for freedom because i just did, i don't know if there are any like real i mean v vote republicans out of office in the united states right like i don't know yeah. you know it's hard because this the deck is so stacked at this point and things are getting so crazy across the world i mean i'd like to hope that something will change but i don't know how should the world just let russia annihilate russians abroad I, I don't know. I mean, no, I don't think so because I feel like I read this really good book. Maybe I've talked about it before on another episode. And maybe this book has been accused of being like a neoconservative stance on Russia. So take that with a grain of salt. But he had this, it was this guy, Peter Pomerantsov. It was called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Kind of like the rise of how like there's like this like mass nihilism in Russia because of like the massive corruption. But he basically said, you know, so many people in Europe and America thought that if you just try and integrate these like corrupt people and in in, like the Russian leadership into like the Western system, they'll like be reformed. And he said, no. What happens is if you let these people do what they do on your country, they're not going to change. They're going to change you, right? You, 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 they will destroy your institutions. And so I think that's a really good response to say we can't just let that happen. Mm -hmm. Because even if it, we do sort of show all the evil things America has done, it's like, that's, I mean, sure, it's like a moral equivalence, but I mean, you can't just say, well, because America did bad things, other countries can do bad things. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if it's a bad thing, it's a bad thing no matter who did it. So you have to denounce the bad thing. And I also think it's, uh, yeah, denouncing is right, and it's important to educate as well. But America's done a lot of bad things, and we don't necessarily talk about them. And they should be taught. And that's the important yeah. I think I think that's our job. Yeah, that's the important part about history. Is um and and that's certainly not going to be taught in Russia at this point. You know, like and that's going to lead to a lot of problems. I really do wonder. I I know that there is there are uh, youth anti-Putin movements, and I've heard you know people in their twenties talking about organizing anti-Putin and having their phones tapped and you know just like being followed things like that. But I don't know if that's representative of most Russians. I'm curious, and those I, kind of cultural exchanges, I think, are I don't know. just invaluable. What is an 18-year-old Russian who's, who's, and I'm sure it varies from, you know, Moscow to the yeah. to the hinterlands, but, but that's important as well. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I really feel like, 
I mean, I guess you could say this at any time in the 20th century or like the last 300 years, but like I really feel like the next decade is going to be incredibly critical because I feel like just we're like especially with climate change, everything's it's such a like there's just a lot of problems. And I think it's like you know how like in American history people will like do these kind of like smart assy like takes where they'll be like, "Oh, you think American politics is divided now? Well, look what like Aaron Burr was calling this guy. A man was yeah. king. Yeah, 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 yeah. And everyone does this, and it's like, oh, so we shouldn't get too riled up. This is just American politics. It's always been, you know. It's like no, no, because. Guess what? They didn't have nukes back in, like, the 1820s, <laughs> right? They didn't have, like, the threat of overwhelming, like, en- environmental disaster. They didn't, they didn't have a powder they did, that you could yeah, put on a yeah. bench that they, killed yeah, someone. Yeah, they didn't have, like, the insane amount of, like, destructive potential that we have now. And they didn't have the same sort of, like, massive prison complex that we have now, industri- military-industrial complex. But there's also something... So to- I feel like it's, like, sure... But the stakes are a lot higher now. <laughs> I think there's also a difference, though, is uh, no one I've talked to, certainly, and this is a question I like to ask when people ha- advocate the hawkish approach, is I say, well, are you willing to go die in Russia yeah. so that they might be yeah, more... Yeah, that's the thing, is, like, are you... I mean, that's the thing, is it's, it's interesting. We're not seeing any, like, equivalent to, say, like, the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. Because in the 30s, that was the thing, is, like, people were like, the Nazis are involved in Spain with against the republicans you know we need to go fight for this cause but you don't see a similar movement happening of like europeans or people from from the americas going to fight in syria or going to fight in ukraine and i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. you don't see syrians fighting in syria no, well they're tr- well because they're trying to leave because, because they don't want to die yeah, because they don't want to die because because there's like yeah i mean syria is a whole other can of worms and syria is actually the topic of our right. next yeah yeah episode. yeah so we'll get we'll delve into these topics further but i think steve you have to go teach yes it's uh and that it's been an abbreviated hour of history but this is an important issue. Yeah. You need to keep tuned to what's happening in Russia. When we discuss Syria next week, we're certainly going to be revisiting Putin, revisiting Trump, and yeah, yeah, revisiting yeah. the climate, too. So thank you for listening. Uh, make sure you subscribe. And uh, we're on Google Play. We're on YouTube. We're on all the platforms. Every single platform. We're on all of them. And you can always visit www.hourofhistory.com. So for now... Thanks for listening. I'm Stephen Bauman. And I'm Matthias Fueling. And thanks for listening. Have a good one. That's your Hour of History.